everyone have a good week? It was a good week. Can we give God a hand clap for last Sunday? How awesome. I think we saw like, I don't know, four or five people got the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and then I think around a dozen people received healing in their bodies. So, and then we had all the water baptisms afterwards, had our uh, baptism barbecue, and it was just so fun to sit with other people and talk with them and get to know them, and um, it was just such a delight to watch God move and to see just the family of God come together. It's one of my favorite things, honestly. Um, <clears throat> we're starting a new series, uh, Into the Wild Heart of God, and I have been really challenged as I've been preparing for this, um, just looking at where, you know, we all have different hunger levels, right? And uh, God wants us to be hungry for him. He wants to be number one in our life, not number two, not number three or four, but number one in our life. And in James chapter 4, verse 8, it says, Come near to God, and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Now, what I want to focus on is you come near to God, and he'll come near to you. We often pray a prayer of like, God, you know, help me to be hungry. God, you know, draw me closer. God, I need this, I need this, I need this. And he's saying, no, you draw near to me, and I'll draw near to you. It's our responsibility it's my responsibility to keep, the, to keep the fire burning. He doesn't do it for me. I have to do it. And I need to protect that hunger. It needs to be something that is so valuable to me. On Wednesday nights, um, we started this influencer. It's about really just being a, a, a godly leader in your sphere of influence. And what does that look like? And the main scripture we focused on was above all else. Guard your heart, for out of it flows the issues of life. Above all else, we're to guard our soul. Because everything that we say and do comes from that seat. And so are we focused on staying hungry for God? Or are we focused on something else? What's, what's, what do you meditate on the most? Kind of tells you what's on your throne. David... He was a man after God's own heart. Uh, let's read in uh, Psalm 42, verse 1. It says, As the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, my God. Hmm. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When can I go and meet with God? My tears have been my food day and night, while people say to me all day long, Where's your God? Have you ever been there where you're in a hard place in life and it's like everybody's like, where's your God? Where is he at? Is he going to show up? And yet David remains faithful. David remains loyal. David remains hungry. He says, these things I remember as I pour out my soul, how I used to go to the house of God under the protection of the mighty one with shouts of joy and praise among the festive throng. Why, my soul, are you downcast? Why are you disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. You know what? It would do us all a lot of good if we would stop in the midst of hurts, in the midst of, like, of, of hardship, in the midst of, of discouragement, to start speaking to your soul. Be not cast down, O oh my soul. I will yet praise God. I want to continue to keep myself stirred up and hungry for him. So that any time that he comes, he's coming. Or I go to be with him, I'm more than prepared. Because I stewarded my soul and my heart. Verse 6, my soul is downcast within me. Therefore, I will remember you from the land of the Jordan, the heights of the Hermon, from Mount Mizar. Deep calls to deep. In the roar of your waterfalls, all your waves and breakers have swept over me. By day, the Lord directs his love. At night, his song is with me. A prayer to the God of my life. 
I say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why must I go about mourning, oppressed by the enemy? My bones suffer mortal agony as my foes taunt me, saying to me all day long, where is your God? Why, my soul, are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. David was so sold out to who God was and is that no matter what he was experiencing in life, he chose that no matter what, he was going to worship God. He had such a hunger for him. When he sinned and slept with Bathsheba, he cried out to God and he said, do not banish me. Do not take your Holy Spirit away from me. It was the most important thing to him. It's like, I realize that what I did was wrong, but please, I need you. I long for your presence. Don't banish me from you. Don't take your Holy Spirit from me. Because David knew that that was the most important thing in life. Even when we fall short, we have to run back to who Jesus is and stay hungry. We have so many things that buy for our attention. Enoch was so hungry for God that God literally took him. Can you imagine being so hungry for God that God just takes you? Never experience death? Hebrews 11.5 says, By faith, Enoch was taken from this life so that he did not experience death. He could not be found because God had taken him away. For before he was taken, he was commended as one who pleased God. How do you please God? Stay hungry for him. God is so jealous over us. James 4, verse 5 says, Do you think the scripture says without reason that he jealously longs for the spirit he has caused to dwell in us? He longs to spend time with us way more than we long to spend time with him. He thinks about you, he thinks about me, every single day, more than all of the grains of sand in the whole world. Can you imagine that? What, what does that mean? Literally, he doesn't stop thinking about you. He's so obsessed with you. And we focus so much here when well, we need to be focused more here and here. Because where does he live? Actually, we, we, we try to worship a God, a God that's without, but he's actually within. What if it looked like if we actually just slowed down and really worshiped him in here? He's in your heart. You just get quiet and still before him. He's here. He's always with you. He's always with me. I forget, I, I looked up the statistic, but I can't remember it offhand right now, but the amount of hours that a person, the average person spends on social media, if all of those hours were spent in the word of God, can you imagine where we would be? My husband will tell you, I almost despise it. I can't stand it. If I'm with you and you're on your phone, I'm here with you. You're on your phone on Facebook. Hello, I'm right here. You're, you're, you're talking to people that you can't even meet with. And yet I'm right here. Value the person sitting across the table from you. Value the person that's in the room with you. Like they're the most important thing in the world outside of Jesus. 
Because of what's happening, those things that are vying for our attention are causing our hunger for God to wane. Look at, look at where you were compared to maybe where you're at now. And if you're more on fire for God now, praise the Lord because then keep doing what you're doing because you're actually keeping your hunger going. You're actually keeping the fire flamed. You're blowing on it. You're, you're tending it. But not so for so many people. Because we preach so much about what God's blessings are that the focus becomes on the blessing instead of the blessor. We preach about everything that God's going to give us, but what about just him? Is he enough? What, what's the first thing? These are challenges for me. They're challenges for you. What's the first thing that you do when you wake up in the morning? What's the last thing you do when you go to bed at night? What does your day consist of? Now, we have to work, and we have bodies that we need to exercise, and we need to eat. We need to steward those things. Absolutely. Let the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, oh God. This was so hard for me because I realized that I have had previous seasons where my hunger was much more than what it is right now. Exodus chapter 3. Oh, that we would run into the wild heart of God because he is crazy, crazy, crazy in love with us. And I use the word crazy in a, like a dramatic way of saying he is so in love with us. He created us to walk with him. At the very beginning, he created Adam and Eve to walk with him. They walked with him. Enoch I'm sure, talked to his great-great-great-grandfather, Adam, and said, what was it like to walk with God? And he told him, this is what it looks like to walk with God. And Enoch is like, I want that. And so he pursued that. And because he pursued it, it, it was pleasing to God. It was so pleasing that God took him to be with him. Huh. Whew, I can't even, my brain can't even compute that. To be so hungry for God. One of the ways that you know your hunger level is at, look, it's, our hunger level is like our spiritual thermometer. We can see where we are at in our relationship according to the level of hunger that we have. How I treat you. Not when you're doing what I want you to. Just because. Exodus chapter 3. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw, though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. Because God is the all-consuming fire. He doesn't need anything to sustain who he is. So Moses thought, I'll go over and see this strange sight, why the bush does not burn up. When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, then God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here am I. It sounds like he drew near to God and God drew near to him. We're waiting for God to draw us and he's saying, just come to me. You may not even feel like it. You may not feel like the, that, that whole, like, come on. Have you ever been in a season, some of you are going to be like, nope, I've never experienced this before. Well, I don't know what to say. But anyway, there have been times where I forget to eat. I'm so busy, I actually forget to eat. There could be times when I've been sick and the last thing I want to do is eat. But I, I know I have to eat. So I make myself eat. You see... It's like that with God. It's like you may not feel like it. It's not about feeling like it. It's about actually sitting down, opening up the word, and reading it, letting it feed you. I can promise you this. If Sunday is the only day that you get filled up, you are not going to last till Sunday night. Because Monday morning is going to come around, and you have to keep yourself hungry. We have to steward and protect our hunger above all else. In the last days, many will become deceived. And the reason why is because we are not 
ca- capturing the spirit of God through the word of God and, and really stewarding the presence of God in our life. Verse 5 says, do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. Then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The Lord gave me a revelation on that. The God of Abraham is the God of the promise. Abraham was the promise of God. Abraham, the God of Isaac. Oh, wait, what was it? I did it wrong. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Oh, the God of the promise, the God of the fulfillment of the promise, which is Isaac. And then the God of Jacob, he's the God of those who contend with him. He is the God of the promise, he's the God of the fulfillment of the promise, and he's the God of us who actually contend with him. And this Moses, at this Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. So the Lord said, and that wasn't a fear as in a terror fear. That was a holy awe of who God is. I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers. And I am concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians to bring them up out of the land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey the home of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Pesachites, all the ites. And now the cry of the Israelites had reached me, and I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now go, I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. If I were to ask most people, when Moses went to Egypt to deliver the Israelites, what, what is he, where was he taking them? Most people will say to the promised land. That's, no, that was the end goal. When he took them out, it says, look, look. Exodus 7, 16 says this. Then say to them, the Lord, the God of the Hebrews, has sent me to say to you, let my people go so that they may worship me. That was the most important thing. Otherwise, what are you doing? You're seeing the blessing and not the blesser. Moses was going to focus on the fact that, look, he left everything. He left everything. He was, ay, ay, ay. here, Hebrews eleven twenty three. 23. Listen, by faith Moses' parents hid him for three months after his birth because they saw that he was a beautiful child and they were unafraid of the king's edict. By faith, Moses, when he was grown, refused, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose to suffer the oppression with God's people rather than to experience the fleeting enjoyment of sin. He chose this. Look, he chose the presence of God above all else. And he knew that when he encountered him in that bush, that encounter forever transformed him and changed his life. And as a result, he knew that when he delivered these people out of Egypt, that he wanted to bring them into the wilderness to first worship God. But they never worshiped. They complained. They wanted everything done the way that they wanted it done when they wanted it done. They were pleased when God parted the Red Sea. They were pleased when God gave them manna. They were pleased when God did things and showed up. But when they didn't show up, when they wanted them to show up, they would cry out and they would say, why are you taking us out in the midst of this wilderness so that we can die? When we were back there, we were eating potatoes. We had beef. We had everything that we had need of. It doesn't sound like the Israelites that were crying and begging for deliverance. That's because they didn't really know God. They didn't. Are you hitting what I'm saying? Psalm 103, verse 7 says, He made known his ways to Moses and his deeds to the people of Israel. You see, there's something about when we steward our hunger for the presence of God, we steward our hunger for the scriptures and the word of God that we want to be. Look, I can never make you happy. You can never make me happy. Only he can. When we are so solidified in our identity, in him, first and foremost, and that can only come from reading the scriptures, from being in his presence, for stewarding our hunger, that we would stay so hungry for God. We have to protect our soul. We have to get hungry and stay hungry. Amen?
So the Lord was speaking. He says to me, what are you feeding your soul? Are we feeding it? Like when you think about something, you want to, oh, here, so good. When you're talking about something and your face lights up, do you ever talk about God like that and have your face light up? If you're talking about shopping, you're like, whoo, we're going to go shopping. I'm going to spend money. I'm going to get new clothes. And they get all excited. Or as my husband would say, cars and guitars. Right? Now we're talking. If our soul is full of cares and riches and the desires of this world, we will never, ever, ever, ever maintain a steadfast hunger for God. Proverbs 27, verse 7 says this, One who is full loathes honey from the comb. But to the hungry, even what is bitter tastes sweet. Do you know what this means? The Hebrews used to teach their children scripture. And when they would memorize a scripture, they would get honey. And this is saying that one who is full loathes honey. No longer wants to partake of the scripture. Because their soul is full and satisfied with the things of the world instead of the things of God. So it's a warning to us that we never come to a place where we're so full, our soul is satisfied with the things that this world has to offer us, that we actually loathe the honey that comes from the scriptures and from the word of God. So how do I maintain a hunger? How do I maintain, like, come on, we've all been there, where there's times there's just like you just feel like you're dry as dry can be, like in the middle of a desert, and heaven feels like brass. How many of you been there? We've all been there. First Corinthians chapter 15, verse 33 says, Do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. Who we are spending our time with is so important because iron sharpens iron. And so do the accountants of a friend. Who we're spending our time with is so important that we're actually, it says, yeah, Proverbs 27, 17, as iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. We're supposed to sharpen each other. It's okay to be sharpened by your friends. To let them call things out in you. Because so that you can keep your hunger level at a level that is pleasing to God. So let's turn to Revelation chapter 3. Verse 14, to the angel of the church in Laodicea, write, these are the words of the amen, the faithful and true witness, the originator of God's creation. I know your deeds. You are neither cold or hot. How I wish you were either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I'm about to vomit you out of my mouth. You say, I am rich. I have grown wealthy and need nothing. But you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in fire so that you may become rich, white garments, so that you may be clothed and your shameful nakedness not exposed, and salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. Those I love, I rebuke and discipline. Therefore, be earnest and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears me, hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in 
and dine with him and be with him, and he be with me. To the one who overcomes, I will grant the right to sit with me on my throne, just as I overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. There's a lot of theologians that believe that this is the last day church. That all of a sudden, in the last days, it's not the riches, it's not just the money. That's, if that were it, I mean, David was super rich. He was a king. He had a lot of wealth. He didn't allow it to get in the way of his relationship and his intimacy with God. We get to choose what we allow in our heart, and we get to choose what we don't allow into our heart. If it's not, money is not evil in and of itself. It's the love of money that's evil. Are you listening to me? They allowed the love of money. They have allowed their, 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 um, their peaceful life. They have allowed their luxuries in life to literally quench and stop them from actually being on fire for God. It was the one thing that he had against them. You see, this isn't talking to the unbeliever. A lot of people quote this scripture and they say, you know, I stand at the door and knock. That's not a salvation call. He's talking to a believer. He's saying, look, I'm standing at your door and I am knocking. It's come near to him and then he'll draw near to you. He knocks, you open. We have a part to play. We have to have a part to play. We have to actually hear his voice. Hear what he's saying today. I prayed, I said, God, I want this message not to fall on deaf ears. When we're singing Lord of the Harvest, I'm like, Lord, and I love, what, I love what you had to say about the harvest. Like everybody has a harvest, whatever it may be. Maybe it's giving out markers and pencils, whatever it is. But what is it that you are doing? Are you actually harvesting? Are you bringing things to the harvest? Are we so hungry for the things of God that we're willing to actually put aside some of the things that are actually consuming our time. When he says, I would rather that you be cold or hot, in other words, be useful, <laughs> you're lukewarm. In order to spew something out of his mouth, it has to be part of his body. And it's been like such a concern. I've been praying and praying my own, my own self. It's not just for you guys, for me. Me, I'm the one. I'm not going to stand up there with all of you. I'm going to be up there by myself. I will be judged for what I've said and for what I've done. I have to guard my own heart. You have to guard and protect your own heart. I have to guard and protect my own hunger. So that I don't look back and go, oh, I remember when I was really hungry back here. But I can say right now, I'm hungrier today than I've been in my whole life. And tomorrow, I'm going to be hungrier tomorrow than I am today. Because I'm going to steward my relationship with him that he is first. Everything else flows from that. Everything else flows from that. How many of you would like the challenge of, like, wanting to be hungrier for God than what you currently are right now? If that's you, stand to your feet. I'm standing. To be like Moses and, and say, you know what, I'm, I'll, I give all this up. All the luxuries, all the just doing whatever, having just an easy life, being Pharaoh's, was it grandson? I count that as rubbish. That's what Paul said. I count all things as rubbish according to knowing him. That we, God, would really feel like that. That we would be like David. Do not, when we sin, that we're so convicted of the sin that we're like, please do not banish me from your presence. Or be like Moses and say, God, do not take us up out of here lest your presence goes with us. Because going into that promised land means absolutely nothing without you. 
All the blessings in the world mean absolutely nothing without him. God, help us to be so on fire. No, thank you. We choose today to steward our hunger and our soul. To put things aside that need to be put aside. All things are lawful, but not everything's helpful. I'd ask for Holy Spirit conviction right now to fall upon each and every one of us in this place. There are things that just are not adding. They're actually subtracting. That you would show each and every one of us what that is. And that by your grace, God, that we would be able to put that thing down and put it aside. Put it in its rightful place. That you would remain upon the throne of our hearts. That you would break down every idol in our life. That there would be nothing that would be exalted above you. That we would be able to give whatever you told us to give at any moment in time because nothing has us. That we would have the heart like Enoch who pleased God so much that you took him. Can't get it. I don't get it. We just ask for God. More of you. We choose to draw near to you right now. And you will draw near to us. We thank you, God, for your presence in our life. We love you, we adore you, and we covet your presence in our life. The awareness of it. More Jesus. Even right now, I'm asking Holy Spirit, more more right now in Jesus' name. Come and fill and flood every single person in this place. Those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, they shall be filled. And we are hungry and we are thirsty for you. So I thank you for a fresh infilling of the Holy Spirit right now in this place. More God. More Jesus. Yes, we love you. We, we are hungry. We're here on a Sunday morning because we worship you. We honor you. We glorify you. And we know, God, that without you, we are nothing. But in you, we have all that we have need of. Thank you, Jesus. Rachel, can you come up for a moment? Thank you, Lord. Just close your eyes and... Breathe deep. One of the biggest things that get in the way of us maintaining hunger is just the busyness of life. It's not sin. It's not these big things. It's actually just being so busy. Before you know it, you're at the end of yourself... You barely have anything left to give. And then he gets our leftovers. Let that not be so, God. I repent for every time that I've allowed life to just get too full. I know a pastor that puts an appointment in his phone every day. I think it's at 3 o'clock. Nobody gets that appointment time. That's the time that he meets with God. You can say it's the only time I have. He's not going to make an exception. Three o'clock is the time he meets with God for two hours. Sounds like something that would be a good discipline. We love you, Jesus. more Holy Spirit. We love you. Amen.